So there's 10,000 homeless children in Louisville. Wrap your mind around that. 10,000 homeless kids in Louisville. And that's just the children. There's lots of homeless people all throughout the entire United States, the wealthiest country in the world. And we got people living on the streets. Talk about economic inequality. You can't get a farther. You got the trillionaires and then you got the people who uh, eat breadcrumbs out of the gutter, out of the garbage. They go dumpster diving to get your pizza crust that you didn't want to eat. They live outside in the cold in the tents under bridges. Begging what little bit of money they can get in order to keep going. And this is children. Children haven't done anything to anybody. In Kentucky, you got 800,000 poor people. You have 800,000 poor people. You have one out of four children are poor. And this is like poor, poor. There was that one study that basically said 50% of America is poor. That was when you doubled the poverty line. So if you double the poverty line, you might have 90% in Kentucky that's poor. So when it comes to the obscene amount of wealth that the 1% have, my God, you know, uh, just, just living in a good area. You're a homeless person and you live in a rough area, you're going to get roughed up. But if you're wealthy, you drive a decent car, you go to a gated community, you go to your job you make money there's no danger anywhere you go if you're homeless living on the street eating breadcrumbs and pizza crust out of the dumpsters you also have to worry about other psycho you know um thieves and robbers and uh, you know uh, mentally ill homeless people when you're out in the street plus the police and plus you know any other elite jerk that just wants to pick on you and just wants to bully you it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous and it's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. Um, there's a uh, Russell Brand actually talked about um, this uh, one story about a monkey. There's two monkeys and it talked about inequality and he said that the in the experiment that every time the monkey one monkey did something right he would get a, um, a piece of chocolate and whenever the other monkey did something right he would get a cucumber. And eventually he ate the cucumber, but he was disappointed. But after about three or four times, he started getting pissed. The monkey started throwing a temper tantrum. What the heck? He's getting all the good food, and all I get is a cucumber? I get to eat a cucumber for doing well. So there is something about nature that doesn't like inequality. But for some reason, dog-eat-dog, capitalist, laissez-faire, free market, war society an imperialist capitalist war society so because we live in this this culture it makes more sense to do what they're doing in LA it's easier just to shoot them you saw that one politician going around beating up on the homeless people's shopping carts he just went around attacking all the homeless people that lived in the streets that was his solution right not get him a house and give him opportunity no 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 opportunities don't lift people up. You put more violence on them, and you beat them down, and you beat them, and you put more violence. You make sure they're poorer than what they've ever been. And then that'll be how they get up out of their predicament. And it just doesn't make any sense. It's just so stupid. But that's essentially what we're doing. We're not solving the situation. You know, there's, there's some advocates and coalitions out there and some monies. But this is a situation that could be solved right away. Um, there's the uh, Christian Compassion Act where churches have to house homeless people or else start paying taxes. You're a Christian, you're supposed to love other people, so you should house homeless. There's all these churches. Oh my God, how many churches are there? And there's homeless people on the street. This isn't to put it on the church, but it is, it makes sense because that's, those are Christians that live there. And then um, a, a better idea of how to solve homelessness. Put them in the houses. You have 22 vacant houses for every homeless person out here. 22 empty houses in America. Everywhere I go, it doesn't matter where I go. Whether I'm in Louisville, whether I'm in Breckenridge, whether I'm in Cincinnati, everywhere I go. Empty houses, empty vacant houses everywhere. Some are pretty dilapidated and run down, but other ones are pretty, you know, stand up pretty 
pretty cool things, like you know, pretty decent house. If you're if you're homeless, basically even a rundown house gives you uh, shelter out of the weather. And then people say, well, what about the liability? You know, the liability is just ridiculous. Well, get them to sign a contract that says, hey, you know, you're living in a dilapidated house. Be careful. It's not my responsibility if you, you know, fall down and hurt yourself. Um, but here's a house. And that would solve it. That would solve it if we cared. If we, you know, pushed our politicians. If we cared enough, if we knew our civic understanding. And uh, we had politicians who cared as well. Um, but because there is no, you know, civic engagement, um, especially in Kentucky, there's only about, you know, 40 or 50 percent who vote. So, I mean, that's a very low turnout rate, but it's also the very least you can do when it comes to politics. If you're not voting, you're not doing anything else. You're not talking about the issues. You're not reading about the issues. You're not reading about the candidates. You're not running for office. You're not, you're not putting pressure on the uh, politicians to make sure you're not calling them up and saying, hey, I believe in this bill. You need to do that. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're doing nothing. You're doing nothing for society, for your democracy. You're just saying, oh, I'm just going to, you know, LOL and, until I die. I'm going to LOL till I die. YOLO, YOLO, LOL till I die. So that's, um, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. And then you have all, I mean, you got so many media outlets, media places, politicians, everybody trying to get on the up and up, and yet, the biggest issues are being ignored. The biggest issues in Kentucky are being ignored. In fact, Matt Bevin is talking about gutting out Medicaid. He's going to cut Medicaid and put 800,000 or 600,000 Kentuckians, uh, uh, take away their insurance. They just got the insurance. Half a million Kentuckians now have health insurance. Matt Bevin's going to take it away. So when it comes to like, you know, Joe Girth, when it comes to like you know certain uh, media figures, uh, Al Cross, they don't care about the ten thousand homeless children. They don't care about the eight hundred poor people in Kentucky. One out of five, one out of four children being poor. They don't care that most of the kids in Kentucky have to get on free or reduced lunch. They don't care. They don't care about anybody. It's not the divide between Republicans and Democrats. The divide is between those who care versus those who don't, and they don't care. They have a job, they go do their job, they write up some crap, and then they put it out there and say, hey, I did my job. No, you didn't do your job. You're supposed to inform the public of all the things that they need to be informed about, and then, you know, work on our society. I mean, I just feel like, my God, if there's a state that has as many problems as this one, there's... it's We need reform. We need changes. And if there's no, you know, this is... Um, when it comes to comparing the United States, Kentucky is usually on the bottom of the of the list of the indicators. And I believe what is good with Kentucky can fix what is wrong with Kentucky. Um, but that's not. I'm not going to ignore. You know the the major issues that we have that we're ignoring. So children in West Louisville have fewer opportunities, study says, recent one, March 1st, 2015, WFPL by Jacob Ryan. He's sitting there telling us that young people living in Louisville's westernmost neighborhoods have fewer opportunities for physical, social, and cognitive development. Development. Just thinking and being strong and talking to other people than any other parts of the metropol uh, metropolitan area. According to a recent study by the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, the study measures relative opportunity across all census tracts in the 100 largest metropolitan areas, said Matt Martin, a senior researcher with the Kerwin Institute based at Ohio State University. Researchers examined 19 components that attribute to a wild child's well-being. According to the study, the components data for educational proficiency, proximity to quality health care, volume of nearby toxic release, poverty rates, unemployment rates. So... The, the, the West End of Blue has the worst opportunities, and, uh, you know, this guy, he, he reported on it, so that's good. You know, there, there are some, I, I found out that there's 10,000 homeless because of a report. There are some news outlets that are actually doing good work, but we need to talk about this. We need to point this out, and the, the politicians need to hear about it, and then we need to change things, right? Things have got to change, um, and, um, and so, you know... It's just, uh, it just kind of goes along with the, it's just a, a psychopathic society, and it's uh, it's really frustrating. My God, it is so frustrating. <laughs> you have no idea. It's um, it, it before like 
I don't know. I like my development. I think my development has been actually, God, I, I'm actually in love with the, the, how I have came to be and who I am today. Uh, I've had, you know, I've had my struggles, um, but essentially I, I read some Nietzsche. I read something about um, emotions, how when you have a true emotion, you got to maximize that emotion and then you can get back to normal. Um, so you shouldn't be afraid of your emotions, love, cry, you know, anger, whatever, um, bliss, just um, peace, whatever. So, you know, you, you combine all these things, combine all the struggles. My God, when I was in Louisville, I got robbed so many times. I got robbed by the police. I got robbed by Spalding University. I got robbed by, uh, you know, a couple thugs on the street. got robbed. Even my God, my God. Is that acceptable? Is that okay that I keep on getting robbed? Is if, if I ask anybody to, hey, should, should I stand up for myself? Should I defend myself? <laughs> Nobody would say yes. If I'm waiting for someone to love me in order to care about myself, that'll never happen. So i got to develop this self-love on my own accord. And, um, and that's how you build strong people is with love. There was one guy that had said that the greatest gift his father gave him was telling him, teaching him to believe in himself. That's the best gift he gave him. You're somebody. You're strong. You're going to stand up and you're going to do something. And you're going to be relevant. You're going to make a difference. Stand up. Be proud of yourself. Keep those head and shoulders up. Don't let anybody knock you down. Be proud. And love and care about others. So, I, I like my struggles and my difficulties. Um, I don't like my struggles, but I like the development that it has turned into. Because, you know, when, when, let's give an example. If, uh, if I was to get raped, okay, I got raped yesterday. This is, this isn't a, uh, I didn't, I've never gotten raped. I have actually had a jailer in Louisville stuck his finger in my butthole. For no reason. I'd already been, you know, fresh two or three times. He was just doing it as a punishment. So, I think that's a good example. Let's just go with that example because that actually happened. Okay? So, I mean, um, I use the term rape because people can understand it. Well, they stole $50,000. That's not a crime. Stealing $50,000, that's not a crime. Coming in your house and taking stuff, that ain't a crime either. What is a crime then? A crime is whenever a cop runs into you and starts beating the crap out of you for no reason. That's a crime, right? Oh, you was walking on the street? Well, I'm a cop. I'm allowed to just put charges on you for no reason. That's LMPD. They're terrorists. They're attacking a civilian population for political reasons. So, I had a jailer. He stuck his finger in my butt. I had, um, you know, I had lawyers and, um, and, and I had lawyers and they were, uh, you know, they were essentially saying... They didn't care. They didn't get the videotape. They didn't make an issue. They didn't file a report. They didn't give me the advice to do something about it. My God. I mean, maybe maybe that's just how jail is or something. Maybe it's just the people that have been running into. But you're going to tell me that a woman goes to jail and a person, a male, sticks their finger in her butthole and then that goes nowhere. Nobody cares about that. No charges, no report. Nothing is, you know, nothing is carried out from there. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. And it's um, if I have to wait for somebody to say, hey, you know, you're you're a stronger person than that. Don't let them stick your finger, you know, their finger in your butt. Don't let that happen. That's not right that they did that. And if I have to wait for someone to love me in order to say, hey, you know, you, know, you shouldn't let jailers stick their finger in your butt. That'll never happen. That love will never come. The love has to come from me. It has to come from my inside. And so, you know, um, I'm safe now. I'm in a safe spot. I'm enjoying where I'm at. I'm getting stronger. I feel strong. I feel good. I feel so good. So I like this development. I like how it's made me. When I stood up to my abuser, I got beat up as a kid, you know, um, for 17 years straight. Nobody gave a damn. Nobody give a crap. The teachers are just, you know, do this, do that. Now go home and get beat up. Oh, okay, great. I guess order is all you give a crap about. Do you care that none of your teachings didn't mean anything because it all was deleted as soon as I got smacked around? So that's frustrating. That's really frustrating. These are people that are supposed to be leaders in the community, in the school systems. 
I even hear that there's going to be a shortage of teachers because it's not a good career opportunity anymore. So I would be a different kind of teacher. I would be a person that would actually want to inspire people. Um, so I, that was fun to just explain. Thank you for listening to that. <laughs> But it feels good because, I mean, if you don't have this process, if you don't have anybody telling you this stuff, you've got to find out yourself. Some of the best inspirations that I've had, Joe Rogan, he, he talks very good. He says people that have a lot of emotional problems don't work out because when you work out, you, you get to a limit where you're like, God, I'm tired. I don't want to go on, but you push it and you go on and you push your, your muscles and your, your body to the limit. And then once you've worked a hard um, workout, then everything else just kind of pales in comparison. And so that just that just sounds so brilliant to me. Jim Carrey, Russell Brand, Jink uh, Ugar. These are really inspirational people. Um, uh, Jim Carrey said he was sitting there thinking about something, and he was like thinking about, you know, he's got these thoughts, and he's thinking about all the thoughts, and then all of a sudden he started looking at himself from a different perspective, as a person thinking thoughts and so when he started looking at himself from a different perspective as a person thinking thoughts he, everything just went away he just started thinking what is this what is this about what is this <laughs> and he said that his entire universe just expanded and it just made him think about so much more because it just says who is he who is Jim Carrey when he was not himself or his thoughts but he was another person, you know, kind of looking at him from a different perspective, you know, but he's in his own head. And so he said he felt this cosmic oneness with everything, with the entire world. And it was inspiring and it was really cool because it almost seems like he says thoughts are the reason why people are miserable. And then maybe it's also the reason why they're happy, but thoughts are why people are miserable. And so if you could disassociate yourself with the thoughts or to get into that sort of meditative spiritual place that's a good you know that's a good advice by Jim Carrey and I appreciate um, you know his his words of inspiration lastly but not least I'm going to talk about this this is a big deal to me okay I'm getting beat up my entire life this is also big in the black community I remember saying something about hitting um, you know, uh, if a person wants to hit a kid, they should be hit back. And then they, uh, a black man told me, well, a black, a, a black people can never say that about their parents. <laughs> oh, it's a black white thing, huh? I saw a statistic, actually, it was in here, and basically it said four out of five Americans are, are spanking their kids. Physical punishments can range from soft swats on the bottom, use of implements like a board, rod, or fly swatter to a mild slap across the face or other parts of the body. Some may even spank their children with a belt. Most parents use physical punishment to correct unacceptable behavior. Children stop disobeying or hurting themselves. They want to get the child's attention and correct bad behavior, not simply cause the child pain. No. No. My childhood was, they, were, they wanted to cause child pain. They are frustrated with their own lives. They didn't like, you know, where they were, the disrespect or the, you know, the, I guess, irrel I don't know what it is. They were having struggles in life and so they took it out on us. It was anything that was impatient. It had nothing to do with being bad. I was probably the most submissive, obedient uh, child that a person could ever come across. Someone once mentioned to my mother that I was too good. Oh, he's too good. And is that good? Wow, I tell that kid to shut up and he just sits in that chair for hours. What a good kid. What's he doing in the chair? Oh, he's staring at a wall. <laughs> what a good kid. Very obedient. So the, the thing I want to point out with this, I think it's ridiculous, okay? Um, the Harris poll conducted in 2013, 81%, four out of five Americans spanked their kids. So when I think about sort of... Um, not simply to cause the child pain. No, it was all about causing the child pain. That's all it was. You know, sure, sure, sometimes I might have, you know, I don't know, said or done something that, you know, wasn't kosher or wasn't acceptable. I would say 99% of the time, it was something dumb. Get your elbows off the table. Don't drink too loud. How come you're eating with that? Don't eat like that. Why are you eating like that? Why are you doing like that? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Uh oh, listen to me, boy. You do as I tell you, boy. You ain't nobody, boy. 
It was to cause pain. It wasn't a loving. Okay, so here's here's the point that I want to make. Okay, so um, in a 2014 Time article, because this is sort of saying proponents are saying this, but opponents are saying that. The proponents say this, and so it was actually a pretty good balanced article. I um, mean, in 2000, I, and I hated it, right? I hated. It. <laughs> Um, but th this made me think a little bit about it because in the 2014 Time article, Dr. Jared Pingleton defended the view that spanking's okay um, as long as it's not out of anger or impatience. That's the reason I got hit because my parents were impatient. I actually remembered my parents uh, telling me about my siblings and saying how much, um, uh, how, you know, they just get so much of their frustration. They love hitting my younger siblings. They loved it. They loved it. They, they couldn't, uh, you know, uh, loved it anymore. They absolutely loved it. They loved it. It felt good. It felt good to them. I called child services on them, and then eventually I get some charges, and then I've been, you know, going through the damn court system with these same assholes for about five or six times. The first charge they put on me was filing false allegation. No, that actually happened. That was true. And so, you know, they're the ones that have started this. They started this shit when I was a fucking kid. They've been kicking my ass. And then when I say, hey, you're not going to do that to my siblings, now they're going to put charges on me. And then I have to go through the rigmarole because the stupid-ass fucking prosecutor just went ahead and went along with it. I wish I could have just, uh, you know, I was in Louisville trying to do my own thing and just live my own life. But it wasn't, they didn't want that. And they sued me again. And then my sisters yelled at me. First they hugged me. They said, oh, we love you. And then they started yelling. <laughs> yeah. It was frustrating. It was the most frustrating thing in the world. These are people that I love and adore. But they cannot look at me as a human being. I'm somebody to be dehumanized, to be yelled at, to be disrespected. Not someone to be respected. Not someone to take serious. The only way they'll ever respect me is if I can hang them upside down and beat them up. And yell at them until they piss all over themselves. So it's, it's disgusting. It's disgusting and reprehensible the way that they behaved. So even the guys who say that they are in favor of spanking, Dr. Gerald Pingleton defended this view. If he or she is deliberately disobeys, the child should be informed of the up, upcoming spanking and escorted to a private area. The spanking should be lovingly administered in a clear and consistent manner. That isn't what happened. It was very public. It was in front of everybody. I'm the boss here. Shut your damn mouth. And they would all stare. I remember I was the one that got hit the most. And then they all just stare at me. What's he going to do now? Is he going to cry? Is he going to get mad? They didn't say, God, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. Why is this happening? No. They internalized it. It was acceptable behavior. There was no conversations. There was no development of mind or cognition. There was no conversations ever. Oh, I can't remember one conversation. Not a real conversation about anything substantial. So, this is not, you know, this is not what people are doing. Some people may do this. Some people may be, you know, sort of respectful or nice and they love the kid and it actually hurts them worse than it hurts the kid. Maybe that's possible. Not for my parents. My parents enjoyed hitting us. My parents enjoyed uh, doing really bad things to us. And um, and unfortunately, I guess if you you know you're a, a, a woman, then uh, your life is way more easier than if you're a man. Um, the struggles that I've had, you know, yeah, I'm gonna do it on my own. I've been trying to do it on my own since I've been 17 years old. But it's rough out here, and with people robbing me all the damn time, you know. And me getting screwed over all the damn time. And then me thinking that being good is being obedient. It never has been. And it never will. You cannot be obedient and gain respect. That never works. So, in a 2014 Time article, Dr. Jared, Ping Jared Pingleton defended this view. If he or she deliberately disobeys the child, should be informed of the upcoming spanking and escorted to a private area. The spanking should be lovingly administered in a clear and consistent manner. This is a proponent. This is an expert who proposes this. And he is actually saying something completely different than the people that had hit me. The people that defend child abuse. This is not what they do. This is They are not being respectful. They're not being nice. They're the boss. You shut your mouth. And if you don't shut your mouth, you're going to get hit. Um, and it has nothing to do with uh, correcting or you know changing their behavior. It only has to do with you shut up. You're nobody. Go sit in that chair and stare at a wall. 
Well, why am I staring at a wall? Just because I'm annoyed and I don't want to have, I wish I never had kids and I hate, the, you know, that I have to go get a job and feed you and um, you don't give me good conversation. I don't know what the reasons are, but it doesn't matter. You know, I would have been better off in an orphanage. In an orphanage, I would have had to stake out my own claim. I would have had to learn to speak up and stand up for myself and uh, instead of having to undo everything that was done to me. Being obedient doesn't, you know, being obedient, submissive, not standing up for yourself, not being assertive, that just doesn't, it doesn't work. Bullies do okay in society. Bullies do okay. Bullies have used power in a bad way, but they get what they want. So how do we teach those who are being bullied to also stand up for themselves and get what they want? We need to show a path. We need to show that, you know, this is a democracy and that we tolerate other people's views and that you can't just go around bullying people. You can't bully people. And I think that, that that's a huge problem, bullying. But teachers are the biggest bulliers. 100% compliance. You'll do as I tell you. Parents are bullying their kids. 100% compliance. You'll do what I tell you, when I tell you, no matter what. Shut your mouth. Jean-Jacques Rousseau says that a child should be free to do as they want, to do as they please. And then they develop themselves. They find out what they want to find out in the world. And then you got to integrate them into society. Not, not the other way around. I'm hitting a five-year-old because they're, they're adults and they should know better. I hate that type of reasoning. I think it's a bunch of psychos. And that's, um, <laughs> spanking is not okay. Violence is not okay. The big four evils, you don't murder, you don't rape, you don't steal. And you don't hit. But we're a society that can't even agree that murder is wrong. Cops are killing people, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. We're still war bombing countries and drone striking countries. We have no business bombing and drone striking. We're not very good world policemen. We're Rwanda genocide, uh, the Sudanese genocide. We we stand by when there are real atrocities happen, and if we're a force for good then we should stand up to these things. And if we're not going to stand up to these atrocities, then let's just pack our bags and come back home. You know, we don't need all the military bases. Let's have U.S. embassies that work on trade and diplomacy. And let's not try to militarily dominate the world. So, that's, uh, and Adolf Hitler was, he they spanked Adolf Hitler. So I don't know if that's, I would say that has something to do with it. I remember uh, Adolf Hitler was talking about in his book that when his father was sitting there spanking him, he just tightened himself up and he showed him. He showed his father by not showing that it hurt. That showed him. No, what would have showed him is if you would have bent him over and spanked him. If you would have enslaved him and yelled in his face to where he pissed on himself. If you was to hang him upside down and beat the crap out of him. That would have showed him. This is not just, this is not right. Your behavior is unacceptable. You can't go around hitting kids and having a good old time hitting kids thinking that's the acceptable way to behave. It's not acceptable. And I'll, and I'll hold that position forever. So, you know, yes, I am sort of going on and on about this, but it, it's important to me because I don't care about child abuse. I don't care about any type of abuse, elder abuse, women abuse, men abuse. I don't care about any type of abuse. We should not be hitting each other. And that what we tell kindergartners don't hit. Well, how are you going to tell a kindergarten not to hit when they're getting hit every day when they go back home? Perhaps there are some good parents out there. I can raise my kid without having to hit them one time. All you need to do is build trust with them, and they'll want to do good in your eyes. But if you don't build trust with them, they won't want to do good in anybody's. You know what I mean? If it's all about the trust. You're bigger than them. And children love infinitely. They'll love their mass. They'll love their abuser no matter what. No matter how atrocious, no matter how bad that the thing happens, they'll still love them. Children's love is a filial love. It's an infinite love. And so instead of taking advantage of that infinite love, we should protect that. We should protect that innocence. And, um, and we should, you know, teach them to be strong, civic-minded, independent thinkers. People who are capable of standing up for themselves and asserting themselves. Having pride in their accomplishments. Um, 
having a, a, a zest, a zeal for life. That's what we need. So, yeah, so fuck the spanking, fuck the war, fuck poverty, fuck um, all the bad shit that's happening. Come on, Kentucky, let's stand up. We can do better. We can do better than this. We can and we shall. Occupy.